Let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this privilege of being able to look at your word. We ask that you would open hearts, open the hearts of each one of us to receive your word. Teach us. Um, We ask that you would truly be honored and glorified. The name of the Lord Jesus would be lifted up and honored. Uh, Use this time to um, advance us toward your kingdom, to impact us, to grow us. And thank you, Father, for hearing us and for the perfect ways in which you'll answer. Amen. Amen. All right. My topic is the critical importance of the doctrine of reward in free grace theology. It's not just important in free grace theology, but free grace theology is only where you're going to find reward. Um, So in the introduction, you'll see in the handout, Reformed theology eliminates reward. Reformed theology would be Calvinist theology, would be basically, not always, but a lot of times where you'll hear lordship, salvation, uh, theology taught, uh, that's typically Reformed or Calvinistic, they eliminate reward. They'll say all believers are rewarded the same because in their theology... Um, all believers are going to persevere to the end with good works and finish faithfully. And so, uh, reward is not really a, a part of their theology at all. All believers are rewarded the same, or they'll state it, eternal life is our reward. Of course, that contradicts the concept of free grace, right? Whereas eternal life is a gift and it's by grace. Others ignore reward. Um, they'll say something like, we should not seek reward. Uh, we should live for Jesus because we love him. I don't have a problem with uh, serving Jesus because we love him. Um, however, uh, I don't think that's why we want to eliminate reward. In fact, most preachers and Bible teachers rarely, if ever, teach on eternal reward. And Connie and I have been in a lot of churches, we visit a lot of churches, <clears throat> and it's only in a free grace church where we've ever heard anything about reward. Free grace theology embraces reward because it is so important to the Lord and it's so critical to our spiritual lives. Now I want to give just a brief testimony. I uh, Came to faith in Jesus uh, for eternal life as a junior in college. I grew up Roman Catholic, and God used a couple of Roman Catholics, actually. It was strange uh, to really open my eyes to the truth. And then I read, I went to a Christian bookstore. I'd never been in one before. Didn't know what I was doing in there, but I bought a book. I thought the title looks intriguing, and it was called Jesus is Coming Soon. So my very first book... A Christian book was purchased as a non-Christian, and I took it home, started reading it, was enthralled by it, and fascinating, uh, the right in the center of that book, the author gives a presentation of the gospel. And it was pretty clear, as I remember back then, uh, talked about how Jesus died for our sins, paid the penalty completely for our sins, sin is not the issue, it's believing Jesus for eternal life is, is really how it's, that's the issue and that's how we get into the kingdom. And at that moment I believed. And prior to that time I had a roommate who was from a Roman Catholic background, but he was converted through a campus ministry about a year prior. And that room, roommate was constantly trying to win me over, but he didn't know how to share the gospel. So he would leave tracks around, and uh, I knew he was in the apartment by the tracks. I could just follow his tracks. He would leave them on my pillow. He'd put them on my plate before I'd go grab it to put my food on there, and there would be tracks, and I'd just brush them off. I don't remember. But one thing he said really grabbed my attention is he knew for sure he was going to heaven. And that is what I wanted to know. And so I got a hold of this book. And at that moment, I believed up to that point, he would ask me, are you sure yet? No, I'm not. And that afternoon that I believe is a Saturday afternoon. 
he walked in. He goes, well, are you sure yet? I said, yes, I am. I know for sure I'm going to heaven. And he just about went through the roof. Um, but a, about a year later, um, I was talking with a Christian co-ed on campus. And she said she had just heard about this concept of reward. Um, she said, well, do you think there's anything to it? I, she said, I just heard that, you know, Jesus is going to evaluate our lives for reward uh, in, in the kingdom. And I, I immediately rejected it. <laughs> I, uh, I, I say this to my shame because I didn't want to think there's going to be an accountability factor. I, I was so excited. I believed in Jesus that I, I, and I knew for sure where I was going to spend eternity, but I didn't want to know that I was going to be accountable. And my experience in the kingdom was dependent on my faithfulness to Jesus. But over time, I began to see it more and more. And eventually I got into a church of a Dallas Seminary grad who was teaching on it. And I, I bought into it so much so that I did my master's thesis in that area. And of course, um, been studying it ever since. And, and now I can almost see it on every page of scripture. But we'll get into that. So, Roman numeral two, the Bible is replete with communication about reward, showing its importance to the Lord and its significance to us. And I list a few verses there. These are not the only ones that deal with the concept of reward in the Bible. Um, But you know, if the Lord says it once, it's important. If he repeats it, we better take heed. And when he says it over and over and over again, that's something we definitely need to take to heart. So the importance of reward is shown by the amount of times we see it over and over and over again in Scripture. Roman numeral three, the Lord modeled the importance of reward. I think we can see this back in the Old Testament. For example, Isaiah 53, verses 6 through 12. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. My righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, notice the therefore here, the transition. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He will divide the spoil with the strong. And I think the strong is a reference to faithful believers. He poured out his soul unto death. He bore the sin of many. The reason he is going to... um, he is going to have a portion with the great is because he was willing to lay down his life for us. Um, I think this is indicated, the same concept is indicated in Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being equal with God, made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men. He humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even to the death, even death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, notice the therefore again, this transition. As a result of that, God also has highly exalted him. And given him the name above every name, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What this is saying is, Jesus' importance in the kingdom, his greatness, his rule over the entire world was gained because of his obedience to the Father. That's the only way I can take that passage and the therefore as a result. Um, Also, Hebrews 2.8.9, I think we see it there. You have put all things in subjection under his feet, but now we do not yet see all things under him. This is man in general. We were created to have dominion over the earth. We lost that due to disobedience. Um, But Jesus has gained that back, and he's going to offer it to his faithful followers. So you put all things in subjection under his feet. Now we do not see all things put under him, but we see Jesus who is made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. There again, because of his suffering and death on our behalf, in obedience to the Father, he is crowned with glory and honor in the future. Or Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. 
Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. In my opinion, he looked to the joy of the reward. Uh, That's what Hebrews... um, Oh, I said Hebrews 2, 8, 9. That's Hebrews 1, 8, 9. 1, verses 8, 9, the one I just read. Um, Found a mistake. The proofreader didn't catch that, I guess. Um, But the joy in connection with that, I think Jesus went to the cross looking forward to the joy of the reward the Father would give him in the future, willing to despise the shame for that reward. Revelation two twenty six and 27, And he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. So the, the context indicates to me that Jesus gained the reward He received it from the Father for obedience. We are to look to Him as our example, and in following Him, we're following Him toward great kingdom reward. uh, Revelation 3.21, To Him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. Jesus gained the throne because He overcame through suffering and death in perfect obedience to the Father. And therefore, he's willing to give that reward to anybody who follows him. So the Lord certainly modeled the concept of reward while he was here in the first advent. Uh, Roman numeral four, the Lord commanded us to pursue reward. Now, if there was no other reason for us to look at reward, it would be this. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What could this treasure be except kingdom reward? It's certainly not eternal life. That's not something we strive for. We know that we receive it once in time at a moment in time when we believe Jesus for it. This is the concept of reward, and it's a command. It's in an imperative form. Uh, Roman numeral five. Pursuing reward honors the Lord. So here's another good reason why we ought to pursue reward. In 1 Samuel 2.30, God says, Those who honor me, I will honor, and that is the concept of reward. Uh, or great is your reward in heaven, Matthew five twelve, and and we go a few verses later. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I believe any reward we obtain will be glorification to the Father. Roman numeral six: reward is a powerful motivation to live for the Lord. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each one according to his works. I think that's about as clear as as it can be. Uh, Or in Matthew 25, Jesus says, Watch therefore. For you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants, delivered his goods to him, and then he goes into what we call the parable of the talents, where he disperses uh, five talents to one servant, two to another, one to one, and then he goes away, which represents his ascension into heaven, And then he returns, which is when he's going to uh, um, convene the judgment seat of Christ. And as a result of the judgment seat, he's going to announce a reward to individuals. 
Or another parable. He spoke another parable because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Therefore he said, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom in return. Of course, Jesus represents, or the nobleman represents Jesus. Going into the far country represents his ascension into heaven. And then he receives the kingdom. He he is seated at the right hand of the Father until his enemies are made a footstool under his feet. We see that in Psalm 110, Hebrews 1, 13, and then he will return. And it's at that time he will convene the judgment seat of Christ. And he goes into the parable of the minas at this point, And he gives each servant one mina. And I think that's the, the mina represents, in my opinion, the opportunity to serve the Lord. And of course, when he returns and he calls him into an account, uh, one has made 10 minas with his one, and that one is put over 10 cities. Uh, One has made five minas with his one, that one is put over five cities. The reward is commensurate with the effort. And the, the final one, did nothing with his. He buried it. And of course, that mina was taken from him. That does not mean he lost eternal life. It means he lost the opportunity in the coming kingdom to have great significant service to the Lord. Um, Or therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror or fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Certainly, this is the Apostle Paul writing this. Certainly, he is showing he was motivated by reward. Um, he looked forward to the judgment seat with some fear and trepidation, but in a healthy way. Um, In fact, reward was so important to Paul that in the last letter he wrote, 2 Thessalonians, very last chapter in these verses we're about to read, he's looking back over his life, and here's what he writes. The time of my departure is at hand, meaning he was about to die and he knew it. Um, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me on that day. And not only to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So at the very end of his life, Paul is thinking of one thing the reward that he's going to gain in the future as a result of having finished his life faithfully for the Lord. Uh, We see that reward was a motivation for Moses. We find that in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Moses, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, Why? For he looked to the reward. That was Moses' motivation. Um, Peter, I think, uses reward as a motivation. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. I may have to skip a few verses because the time is going faster than I am. But um, in this you greatly rejoice. So now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This revelation is when Jesus returns to the earth. And the hope is that our, as we are brought before him at the judgment seat, that um, our, our faith demonstrated by continuance in obedience uh, will result in in praise and honor. Um, in the last words of Jesus, Revelation twenty two, twelve. we'll skip the next passage. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. The very last words of Jesus in the Bible have to do with reward and the offer of reward uh, to those 
who finish faithfully. I have a quote here by Zane Hodges, eschatology, which is the course, the study of last things, the study of eschats. No, it's a study of last things, I'm sorry. Um, That includes the concept of reward. Zane said, eschatology properly conceived as a primary New Testament motive for obedient living. And I think that's exactly right. In fact, my master's thesis had to do with the judgment seat of Christ as a motivation for Christian living. That's the concept of reward. Thought, properly understanding kingdom reward means viewing it as far more than a crown given back to Jesus. That's a that's a misconception um, that's that comes from uh, Hebrew. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter four. That refers to the twenty four um, elders casting their crowns, but they do it over and over and over again. Uh, if you notice in uh, verse ten, it refers to far greater eternal reward. Refers to far greater eternal fulfillment. Experiencing. What God has called us to experience. Rule, dominion over the world. A deeper intimacy with Jesus, picturing by eating at his table, sitting on his throne. Greater privilege bestowed by Jesus himself. Uh, Recognition and commendation by our Savior and our Father. Who wouldn't want those things? I mean, if we are believers in Jesus, don't, isn't, aren't those things we would want? Don't we want commendation from him? Well done and good and faithful servant. Don't we want a greater intimacy with him in the kingdom? Don't we want greater service to him in the kingdom? Don't we want the privilege of being able to uh, eat at his table, uh, to sit with him on his throne? I would say absolutely. Um, Jesus will say things like, well done, good and faithful servant. I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. The Son of Man will confess him before the angels of God. These are individuals who are faithfully confessing Jesus. I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. Roman numeral seven. Reward teaches us much about God. A, reward demonstrates God's grace. He will reward generously well beyond what we deserve. And there's an encouraging thought to me. Notice in Matthew 25, this is the parable of the talents. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Notice his graciousness. Faithful in a few things, ruler over many things. The graciousness of God in rewarding. Um, and he who overcomes keeps my works to the end. I will give power over the nations as I also have received from my Father. Also in Revelation 3.21, I will grant to sit with me, me on my throne as I also overcame. He is willing to share his reward with us. That's very gracious of the Lord. Or therefore I will divide him a portion with the great. We've already read that verse. But he is willing to divide the spoil with the strong. Uh, Letter B, reward demonstrates God's love. It demonstrates his grace. It demonstrates his love. God certainly would not have to reward obedience, but God desires to reward his children, demonstrating his love toward them. We're children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We're all heirs of the Father in a general sense, but we're only heirs with Christ, sharing with Him in the glory of reward if we suffer with Him. If we live faithfully, we are going to suffer. Zane Hodges wrote, let's gratify God by valuing what He wants to give us. That's a great quote. Uh, C, reward demonstrates God's mercy. He will reward generously some who have failed greatly. And let me just posit one name, David. David obviously failed greatly. God's going to reward him greatly. Not for his failures, but because David confessed, moved on from adultery, from murder, and God is going to reward him to the point where it looks to me in Ezekiel 
that God is promising David is going to rule over Israel. Letter D, reward demonstrates God's justice. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. That seems just. The second one gained five with his. He's put over five cities. It's commensurate with faithfulness. Uh, But the final one lost his opportunity to serve his Lord in a significant way. That doesn't mean he won't be serving in some capacity in the kingdom, but he lost out on significant service in the kingdom, in my opinion. And then look at the life of Paul, what we have here and listed in uh, 2 Corinthians 11. Five t- I won't read all of it, but just the first few lines. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, etc., etc. This is because of Paul's faithfulness to the Lord. He, w- he suffered great persecution. So based on the suffering he experienced in serving Christ, would it be just for all other believers to have the same eternal experience as Paul? I think not. I think not. Would it be just for Paul to go through all that suffering and have the same experience as, uh, we'll say Joe Goodneighbor again, bring him up as a believer this time, who believes in Jesus but then does nothing with his life? No, I don't think so. And that's not how Scripture presents it. Roman numeral eight. The concept of reward is consistent with free grace theology. Reward helps to answer the question, if eternal life is a free gift, why shouldn't we live rebelliously after receiving it? Or if heaven is a free gift, why can't we live like the devil? I think that answers that question because it's going to matter how we live uh, after we believe in Jesus. In fact, our eternal experience, not where we experience eternity, but how we experience eternity will matter in a deep way how we follow Jesus here and now. This letter B, the same hermeneutic or a contextual plain sense hermeneutic, how we understand the Bible, that reveals free grace theology also reveals the concept of reward for faithfulness. All right, let's look at the conclusion. Is is pursuing reward selfish? I think that's a question we need to answer. And I quote Larry Crabb for this. It's a strange source, but uh, Larry said, self-interest is not equal to selfishness. Don't apologize for wanting what God wants to give you. I think that, that connects very resolutely with the concept of reward. I am thankful I have learned about eternal reward. First, the concept of reward helps me see the reality of free grace theology, which includes the gift of eternal life and the critical importance of living in obedience after receiving eternal life. Secondly, the concept of reward encourages me to follow the examples of Jesus, Paul, Moses, etc., who sacrificially lived in a way as to obtain great kingdom reward. Thirdly, the concept of reward teaches me much regarding the character of God, such as his grace, his mercy, his love, and his justice. Fourth, the concept of reward shows me that I honor the Lord by pursuing reward. And here I go to Earl Rodmacher as my source. Now, actually, originally the Bible, but I like this quote from Earl. Why should I work for reward? Because that glorifies the Lord. And the greater the reward, the more my opportunity to glorify Him for all eternity. So how could I do anything better than to work for reward for the Lord? To work for reward is not selfish. It is to obey the Lord and do what He wants me to do. I think that captures it. Number five, the concept of reward provides me with motivation to live for Jesus when times get difficult or when temptation comes. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. Uh, if he de- we deny him, he also will deny us. That's 
He'll deny us reward. He won't deny us eternal life, obviously. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Come back to Earl again. This is training time for reigning time. He had a way of putting words. C.S. Lewis is my final quote. If we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. All right. Uh, questions? I guess we've got about five and a half minutes for questions. My timing wasn't good. I should have gone another five and a half minutes and then wouldn't have had time for questions. So. Well, that's a great question. So Paul's, Paul talks about the crown of righteousness being given to all who love his appearing. I think Paul had more in mind than that. I think, uh, I think disobedient believers are not loving the return of the Lord. I don't think they look forward to the return of the Lord. I think the more obedient one is, the more faithful one is, the more they long for Jesus to come back and the more they think about that, the more they love his return. I think that's what Paul's talking about because that's in the context with he's run the race, he's finished the course, you know, and part of his course was going through all this tremendous suffering. And I think he's saying that same reward is being offered to anyone who looks forward to Jesus' return in the way I Paul have. And this probably ties in with First John two twenty eight. Yeah. You know, abiding in him. Yeah. Abiding. We got a question here. Yes. I got one online here. Okay. Uh, question online in light of James two thirteen. Could you comment on the role of being merciful? Yeah, that's uh, good. To others and the mm-hmm. rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. Yes. So, yeah, and two, let me just read those, uh, verse 2.12 and 2.13. James is talking uh, in the context of the judgment seat of Christ, and he, that's a great, in fact, as I was just delivering this a couple minutes ago, I thought, you know, I should have put James 2.12 and 13 in here, but somebody brought it to our attention. So James says, so speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Um, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What's the judgment that believers will encounter? It's the judgment seat of Christ. What he's saying is, the more merciful we are, and mercy involves Loving those that we might not think, you know, those that are hard to love. Forgiving others, we think, well, maybe they don't deserve our forgiveness. Showing that kind of mercy and love to others. I, I put it this way. I was a long time ago, I was a teacher, and um, I, I, I was taught in school about extra credit. And so... Um, my, one of my favorite teachers in high school was a Mr. Eads who'd give extra credit for all kinds of things. So you could actually, you know, finish as a C student in his course, but if you did enough extra credit, you could be a B student or an A student. And I think of mercy as our extra credit system. We may have messed up royally, but if we show enough mercy, we go from a C Christian to a B Christian, maybe to an A Christian, because mercy triumphs over judgment. That's a great hope. Here and then back there. Yes. Where on the eschatological timeline do you see 
the Bema seat occurring? Yes, yeah, so I, I see that as Jesus, it's after Jesus' return, because that's referred to parable of the meanest, parable of the talents, and other places. Um, and so I think it occurs, <clears throat> Daniel 12 has two periods of time that follow the tribulation period. There's a 30-day period that comes right after that, and I think what occurs in that 30-day period is a judgment of the nations. That's in Matthew 25 um, and verse 31 to 46. And the second one, I think, is another judgment. There's a 45-day period. I think that's the Bema seat. I think that's the judgment seat of Christ because it makes sense to me because Jesus is right there preparing for the kingdom. And so now he's handing out positions in the kingdom, administrative positions. Those are going to rule under him, etc., and getting them ready for that period in the kingdom. Is there any credibility to some theologians that might say that the in the Greek, I think, that the rewards is singular, not plural? And so when Paul talks about prize or reward, it's singular, not plural? Yeah, I think it's significant. I think each one of us will be given a re- each faithful believer will be given a reward singular and i think the reward is many faceted it's greater fulfillment it's it's uh, greater privilege greater intimacy with the lord greater uh, privileges of service of sitting with him at his table sitting with him on his throne etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's a reward that's our reward that's our eternal experience and yes, I think it's singular. I think we've done a disservice of di- dividing it up into rewards like various crowns. I think those are all symbolic of the, the future experience that we'll have in the kingdom. What do you say to those who um, say this is only limited to the millennium? Does it also extend into the eternal state? I wish I had my third book ready because... I do a whole chapter in there on reward is eternal. Um, and the kingdom is eternal. We know that uh, from Second Peter. He talks about the eternal kingdom of our Lord. Millennial kingdom is stage one. Then eternity beyond is stage two. It goes forever. So the, I believe the reward we obtain, just like eternal life is eternal, Reward is eternal also, so it begins in the millennium, but it's going to continue throughout eternity.